get. Okay. So and and like like I say, he uh, David uh, agreed to allow us to record it, the program, and and also. Um, uh, He's donated his honorarium to Data Mammoth, and we uh, we've been going around and, and dating to find out what the environment was like on the coast, particularly the Shalish River Valley. And uh, uh, David Rice has been in, helped us with the first one, and we're getting about eighteen thousand on the on the mammoths we're looking at. Okay, well I'm gonna do a quick introduction here if I have it. I think I have. <clears throat> okay, do you, do you see that, Matt? Great. I want to thank Mac Barkley's on too. You see it okay? All good. I just want to point out this is our ninth uh, Penwas Zoom meeting ever since the pandemic, and it, it, it's allowed us to, to uh, branch out a bit and bring in people. Uh, uh, we might ask uh, Martin Bell to give a talk. <laughs> it would be quite early in the morning for him. I know Duncan is as as offered in in the near in the future, um, but uh, let's see if I can get this to go. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Anyway, we're very excited that David could join us. David Bustos. Uh, and uh, uh, there, he's working, uh, I can tell by just trying to reach him, you know, night and day on a bunch of field work. And that's what he's been doing this week, too. So it'd be very interesting to hear some of the newer things he's working on. Uh, he uh, finds all kinds of arrays of uh, tracks, including kids playing in the, in the, uh, the uh, pond areas, which uh, it's kind of like uh, Martin Bell. His uh, his dates are eight or nine year olds uh, uh, playing in the in the pond areas uh, of East Wales. I don't know if Duncan has found uh, kids tracks versus of adults tracks. Um, and <clears throat> just for planning, we're getting ready for our camp out. It'll be August twenty sixth. The 29th weekend at Hoka River, our annual camp out. And, and the Macaws are opening the reservation after two years and they're advertising Macaw Days. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and this is Mick Carter. This is the way the river was when you were here last time. Now it's all silted in by a uh, major flood event uh, with extreme rain. We're really getting impacted uh, by <clears throat> by uh, the uh, climate changing and the uh, also the sea level rising. Um, this is fixed, so if you come out to Macaw, I mean to Hoko, you can now drive through here. But it's just recently uh, from this slide, and this is the way the cabin was at my place, and this is after the extreme uh, flood. So you wouldn't want to be in that cabin at that point or this, even this cabin, but it broke through the spit and created <clears throat> a big spit in front of the main area. But fortunately we were able to rescue these cabins are all set up and we dug a new outhouse hole. So we're working on getting ready for, for that. So your next newsletter, we'll say something about our plans for the camp out uh, and You'll be able to camp on any of this unless there's a real high tide. Uh, but this is our main complex and our kitchen is right there. But you can put tents out here and not have to worry in it all about, uh, you know, <clears throat> the uh, you do if it's a high tide. And then you can get around here when we go collect uh, mussels. And hopefully it's opened. It's not open right now. But the river comes straight through. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Jennifer Raff, uh, who uh, <clears throat> came out with a very popular book, and I highly make, recommend you read it before June, uh, Origin of Genetic History of the Americas. And uh, 
um, anyway, it shows that a coastal movement very fast, it appears from the, from the uh, DNA work she's done. She's quite keen on white sands and how that fits into it. We have the Chehalis River hypothesis that is the first place best the ice flow you would come in uh, in, in, in uh, into the continent that you could come into the continent would be down into the shaleless drainage and into the continent. Uh, she sees it as a very quick movement and across the Isthmus of Panama and along the South America coast, I'm no doubt up this way too into the Gulf. Uh, a good book to read. It's on uh, Kindle and it's also uh, audio. Uh, she might join us tonight. Is she here? I don't know, but uh, I invited her. Uh, anyway, David, uh, let me introduce him a bit. This is David up in the uh, doing a doing a work on the some of the longest trackways ever found. The longest trackways uh, ever found. Uh, uh, in, in the Americas. Uh, and I know White's, he, he's resource program manager of the White Sands National Park Man, uh, Monument. White, White Sands, is, Sands itself has a long military history for as a missile testing site and even the atomic bomb. Uh, I think David, uh, I think your office is in a military complex. Am I right? <laughs> but it has a long history. Yeah, we're, uh, we're right next. And we've definitely been under the Coyuse area, as you will, that's where they actively fire missiles for close to 80 years, I guess. Well, it's 75 yeah. years. Did any of that impact the footprint track, trackway area? No, well, in, in the past it did. Um, you can actually see, <laughs> Uh, some incredible mammoth prints, and then there's a meter, you know, a, a missile crater <laughs> in the middle. So it stops for a second, picks up on the other side. So um, at one time, uh, unfortunately, the mammoth was long gone, but <laughs> uh, missiles have fallen in, on, on trackways in, in the past. I see. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. Yeah. It's preserved. He, he uh, graduated from New Mexico State University and his uh, major was wildlife sciences. And I think he's classified as a zoologist actually with the Park Service or uh, National Park. Um, Go Aggies. <laughs> Go Aggies. Yeah. And he's worked with the federal government for 20 years. And four of those were in El Dorado forest of Northern uh, California in the, uh, in the Sierra Nevadas uh, and 16 now with White Sands. And um, for over a decade, a decade he's uh, had the experience of working with these fossil footprints. So from the beginning and no doubt having a lot to do with the management of, of what goes on with this. Uh, numerous publications, he's uh, either been main author or co-author uh, and just and he describes the park in one publication in the title as much more than a sandbox. Uh, and these tracks were buried under layers of sand and clay. And I'm just wondering how much clay had to do with some of this preservation, if it was some kind of a waterlogged kind of setting or uh, like a wet site up here. Uh, and then they were revealed uh, initially, I guess, after a flood event. And as um, resource manager, David has worked with a very interdisciplinary uh, team of scientists. Uh, one from England, uh, Matthew Burnett uh, from Bournemouth University, which is be Southern England uh, down in the area, I guess, towards Exeter. And this is a football, uh, excuse me, footprint expert. Uh, and he helped David when they found a, a, a sloth track with a human track in it, you know, so it's pretty <laughs> clearly together. Um, and as I mentioned, my friend Martin, Dr. Martin Bell is with us from, he's a UK archaeologist who uh, is here at 2.30 in the morning and 
he has human tracks that are beautifully preserved that are eight to nine uh, thousand years ago uh, and, and of children eight to nine years old from uh, East Wales, Gold Cliff. Uh, from my experience, and this is the case of White Sands, I don't know if it's the case up with Duncan's site, but uh, kids and dogs in particular really know how to use a beach. I run a <laughs> campground at Apoco and kids really like to get into it uh, and create a lot of probably these tracks. Um, and uh, I don't know if anybody's found anything you could consider dogs, uh, like domestic dogs that ran along in there. Uh, maybe David, if he has, can say something, but I don't know if, uh, Martin, have you ever found dog prints along with the kids tracks? Or something that you might be a domestic dog? You have to yes, turn on. Yes, we have. But I, I've, I've never seen anything with any of these uh, types of site. He, he also works with a, the US Geological Survey and a dating specialist by the name of Jeff uh, Pagotti. And he's quite confident about the dates that they're getting. He's 95% confident. And he works with a geomorphologist named Kathleen Springer, who's also US Geological Survey. And she worked with a trench through the through the site, and I think it was like sixteen layers of uh, what appear to be you know aquatic seeds, and the bottom dating around twenty three thousand, and the top uh, more like twenty one thousand years ago. So two thousand years of occup human occupation and other uh, megafauna. Um, there's some speculation about the seeds being aquatic plants, so they're they're going to cross check all this by dating pollen as well to double check the date. Uh, Dick and I are authors of the Chehalis River hypothesis and I think basically and he might want to say something down the way. Uh, I think basically we feel well people certainly could have come down the coast and in through the Chehalis uh, um, before <laughs> glaciers really became maximum along the coast. Uh, so it's just a, a bit of a, a adjustment of that, not after the maximum, but at, I mean, not before the maximum, but after the maximum. Um, anyway, with that, I, I certainly appreciate uh, um, David joining us tonight, as busy as he is. And uh, I'd like to stop here and, uh, uh, and have him get get set up for his presentation. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Dale. And Thank you. Very happy to have the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. There you so, are. Great. Are you able to see my screen OK? I, yeah, we it? see you just fine. We probably have to share if you wanted to do OK PowerPoint. Let me see. And Matt can help you if there's. And I'm pretty sure I got you in a cohort. So. Okay, it should be sharing now, I think. There we go. I can see okay. it now, David. There Great. it is. Race against okay. time. Does everybody Sorry. see that fine? Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah, well, thank you so much for <clears throat> allowing me to, to speak with you. And yes, please have to answer any questions if you have any. Um, you know, White, White Sands is, is an amazing place for so many reasons. There's always new and incredible discoveries. Uh, we're the world's largest chips in Duneville, but around, um, I guess around 2006, really, we started finding prints inside the park. And that's sort of where the story of the footprints begins um, for, I, for White David, Sands. I should, should point out that you've offered, if we see a question, if I see a question in chat mm -hmm. that, seems appropriate at the point, uh, I'll, I'll ask David to, to answer that. Please do, yes, feel free to jump in. Um, but, but yeah, you know, um, but the, the story at White Sands is sort of fun. It begins with Bigfoot, which all stories should begin with Bigfoot, I think. 
related to. Um, that's where our fossil footprint story begins. So in 1931, a government trapper, Ilias Wright, found um, what he thought was a Bigfoot. You know, he found these incredible tracks. They were um, 22 inches, you know, across and eight inches wide. Um, and for years, you know, they wondered what those were. Uh, they sent out a big group. They never found Bigfoot, of course, but um, later on other uh, researchers came out and they did find other mammoth prints and camel prints. And it was suggested that no, what, what you found was camel slipping in the mud. And, uh, but what's really neat, you know, I, I never seen the pictures of these prints till much, much later. Um, and then one of his granddaughters, I was giving a presentation on the trackways and she came by and said, I want you to see these pictures. This is what my grandfather actually found. I don't know if other researchers have seen the pictures or not, but um, what was incredible, to, I'm sorry, I'll have to pull up, I'll get them at the end, I'll show you what those look like. But um, there were these silhouettes of these prints, you know, and just like he said, 22 inches across and eight inches wide. Well, anyways, Later on in 2017, we found his Bigfoot prints. And when we brushed them out, we found that they weren't Bigfoot necessarily, or I guess they were, but they were a Bigfoot of a giant ground sloth. <laughs> so that was really, really amazing. And that's sort of where um, the, the story of the human prints uh, really got confirmed at White Sands. We um, seen, you know, the possibility of really elongated prints for since about 2009, but it wasn't until 2017 where we found the, the human print inside the mammoth print that really confirmed, or sorry, the giant ground sloth footprint that it confirmed that they're contemporaneous. And since that time, we've been finding overlapping cross-cutting of the megafauna prints and a lot of the human prints. But I'll go ahead and start the slideshow. So um, if you go to White Sands, basically this whole area to the right here is a gypsum dune field. And it all comes from Lake Otero. So basically all the water in the basin uh, goes down, evaporates, and then comes back up. And that's where, really where, um, where, the, where it comes from. You know, the, this whole area is once a giant lake. And so we find thousands and thousands of prints. So around 10,000 years when a lot of the megafauna were going extinct, that's really when the, the gypsum dune field began to form. So it's the world's largest gypsum dune field, but then we have you know, one of the largest concentrations of ice age um, late Pleistocene trackways as well. And basically everywhere we find one of these four track makers, you'll find the other one nearby. So the most abundant tracks we have are those of Mammoth or Mastodon, you know, um, some type of proboscidean. We also have giant ground sloth. There's three species in the region. And then the camels or camelid and human, those are the most common. And of all of those, Mammoth and human seem to be the most abundant. Um, of the mammoth prints, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say there's over 100,000 prints. There's just thousands and thousands of prints. There's actually a huge trample ground that goes from about this part of the park all the way down and around, about 10 miles wide and some places two or three miles across. And most of the other prints cross in there, you'll see interactions happening throughout that um, sort of mammoth trample ground. The other thing really important to note, you know, is, um, and I think what sets the story of White Sands apart, we don't have, of course, the oldest trackways in the world, um, but what we do have very long trackways, and because of that, you can see incredible interactions um, between people and people. Um, you'll see children jumping in the mud. I'll show you some of those prints later on. It looks like maybe a mother or a, uh, a juvenile carrying that child and putting him down again, picking up, up. And then a lot of different interactions between the Pleistocene uh, megafauna with each other or with people as well. Um, and, and part of that, you know, it's, I think it's important to, to know also is this is the homeland of many of the indigenous um, groups in the area. And we've had the great honor and privilege to, to work alongside with many of the pueblos and tribes and then also through our consultation. Um, and, you know, seeing the small baby prints, it really, it's incredible. It brings the story to life, the children prints. And, but the other uh, really incredible experience we've been able to have as we work with some of the tribal community is, you know, they, they have words in their ancestral memory of these giant animals. So they'll have words for, for mammoth or camels or, or other things. And it's just incredible to hear, you know, and it's, oh, you, you, you knew this, this, uh, this, you know, this animal, this, this giant, um, you know, 
uh, mammoth that walked by you, you know, your, your ancestors. It's like knowing a friend that knew, knew someone, you know, it's, it's so much fun to, to hear. And it really uh, brings the story to life to know that someone knew, knew them. Um, but the other thing I, I wanted to, to show, I think for people who aren't familiar with the site, I think sometimes it's thought is, oh, it's, you know, it's a fluke. You found one print here or there and, um, you know, you just happen to find them. And most likely people walked by after the mammoth prints thousands of years later, they just happened to walk by the same spot. But one thing I, I really wanna just show, share with people is uh, we have about six different print types throughout the park. And really the print types, they sort of change in mineralogy or the, uh, you know, the, the um, structure of, of the, the minerals. It's sand or silt or clay or a mixture. The faces of the print sort of change depending where you're at in elevation. And so on the top row David? here, you, yes. Yeah, uh, question we have is how about horse? Are, were there, are they part of that? You know, we, we've seen something that looks like horse and small trampoline. And I don't know if it's a three-toed horse or, or what, what they are. They're, they're about, about like that big. They're not, not too big, maybe two inches or so. But there are a lot of small prints. And I'm guessing that they could be horse. That would be my, my guess, best guess. I think as we go on, we'll, we'll, we definitely, I believe, will we'll find horse one day. But... Um, one of the things I wanted to show is all of these different elevations. So these are all human prints here and then the megafauna prints on the bottom. And so these prints are made of clay. And then below there are prints that they're blown out. So there's nothing filling them. And then these prints, um, they're filled in, but there's no cap or silt um, on top of them, no clay or any layer. And then the other prints that have the best um, toes and the digits and things are the, these prints right here. So these are infilled with a, uh, usually a light sort of white sand and then they'll have a cap over them. But these you can brush out and they um, preserve incredible features, toes and claws and other things can be seen. Uh, even some of the markings of a, of a giant ground sloth when it steps backwards or leans on its tail can be seen as well. And these prints we also call ghost prints. Number four and number six, those sort of can become ghost prints. They both have a cap over them. And so what happens is whenever they're filled with, with water, you'll see a sort of moist layer. Or the, the same is true, sometimes the surrounding sediment's wet and then the inner side of the print is dry. So you have a really nice contrast. And I'll, I'll show you in a little while um, when that contrast isn't there, it's extremely hard to see them. And maybe that's why, you know, just recently we're finding so many prints and they're, they're so easy to, to pass by if, if you're not used to looking for them. And then the last print type we really have are the prints made of actual stone. This is dolomite. So um, there's most of the whole parks filled with, with gypsum, some calcium sulfate, but then the dolomite has a mix of, of um, magnesium in there. So it, it changes the, the composition and makes some very hard stone prints. And we'll have, you know, a, if you find a stone print of a mammoth, you'll find a camel or a sloth or a human nearby, or if you find one of a, uh, the clay print, you'll find the same thing. You'll find human prints and sloth and camel and direwolf. So, you know, wherever you're finding at one print, you'll find a companion of the other representative track makers. And, and then this is, you know, from the most recent paper, sort of exciting where a lot of the dating comes from. Um, but one of the things I, I wanted to point out on the Eastern Lake margins, and I believe that we'll find this in the Western side too. We haven't looked yet, but I believe we'll see the same thing. But on the eastern side, we have about two meters of prints. So you have layer after layer after layer. Um, the original paper, we found 11 layers. Now that, that number is increasing. And we'll be doing more analysis. But what's important to know about that is that every single layer, we're about 16 layers now, you'll find a, a print either um, you know, a mammoth or a human print or, or some other megafauna print. We do have a lot of canine prints, you know, wolf or dog, I'm not sure, but we do find um, more and more evidence of canine. And the other thing sort of interesting about the canine is normally those are um, sort of uh, solitary animals. You don't see big groups of canines, almost just one by themselves. I don't know if I have a good image, but right, right here, actually this print, 
Um, there's a human print and there's a canine print on top of the human print. But every site, there seems to be increasing numbers of canines we're finding. And at first we didn't see children prints and now we just see the children prints everywhere. I mean, where you go, it seems like there's children prints in all sizes, you know, toddlers um, all the way up to, to adults. And the other um, things to, to show you. So I know for some folks that the dates, you know, they're, they're pretty far back. Um, uh, most of these range from about 18,000 to 23,000 years old. So a pretty nice time frame. But what's um, important, you know, even if, if the dates are, are a little bit too much for people to swallow, you can, you can look and see the horizon. So this is one layer after another layer after another layer. And right here, there's a mammoth print and cross section. And then here's some of the prints at the base of this trench. And then further down, there's also mammoth prints. So you'll see this just happening over and over and over again. So, you know, either way, people, we have really, I think, growing evidence that people were walking alongside or living alongside with a lot of this megafauna. So it's been really exciting to see that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these prints, they're, they're rapidly eroding away. So <clears throat> usually within, um, once you find them, where they start to be uncovered by a passing dune or the ground dries out, um, often within only a few years, they, they're completely gone. And so we're working to monitor um, how climate change is affecting them or soil moisture change is affecting them, some of these long-term droughts. Uh, this is an example of 2008, <clears throat> the, the ground became really dry. Usually from the satellite imagery we're using MODIS or some of the ASTAR imagery to look at the um, sort of, you know, the, the thermal inertia or the heat on the ground and soil moisture. And this time it was really dry after a long drought in March, uh, 2008, March 10th. But if you look a few days later, we got a really large windstorm. And that just made a tremendous amount of sediment was moved from white sands and really uncovered a lot of the prints in this area when that happened. So this is a huge dust column um, going from white sands all the way up to uh, Texas and Oklahoma and beyond. So, you know, once if the wind changes the other direction, it's very likely that you all might see uh, some of the white sands in your, in your backyard as well. So even if you haven't been to the, the tracks or white sands, it's possible that there's uh, some of the traces have been to you at one time or another. Um, and then again, you can see some of the erosion, what that looks like. But here's an example of a trackway, 2009, 10, and 11. It's pretty much completely gone. So once they're exposed, they, they rapidly break down. The different prints, they break down at different rates. Um, the clay are some of the fastest ones to break down. They're sort of subject to freeze thawing also once they're exposed. So they, they really um, have a, a rapid deterioration once they're, they're exposed to the elements. To try to document these prints as quickly as possible, we're doing a number of um, using different tools and management um, approaches to try to document. And one of the, the most efficient ways is drones. We were able to do this in 2014. So the UAVs or drones um, from the air, you know, you just get, you can cover large areas and you can see patterns you can't see on the ground. So that's so helpful. Um, right now, unfortunately, there's a stand down on the use of those, but hopefully that'll open up again. But here's a great example of some of the sloth prints and then some of the mammoth prints. And then this is, um, since we're not able to use drones right now, we're also looking at, at fixed wing aircraft. So this is uh, LIDAR, so uh, laser scanning. And then we do a digital elevation map. And this is really great. If you compare it to different years, you can see areas of high erodibility where the erosion is really happening fast. And then that helps you sort of pinpoint and know where to look. So if you look close here, you see these incredible um, trample grounds, just newly exposed, a lot of mammoth prints. Um, up here, and then there, there's some camel prints over there, and off to the side, it looks like there are some human prints sort of running through here as well. So we're, we're trying to, to get out and locate where these um, are exposed and we're trying to document them as quickly as we can. Uh, mostly that's with photogrammetry, so we can make exact 3D replicas. And so this is what some of the photogrammetry looks like. So this is an ortho mosaic. Maybe, I think this is probably about 500 images or so to make this, this uh, mammoth trackway. So 
uh, I believe this is about nine and a half, maybe 10 feet um, from one step to the, to the next. So pretty large, but not the largest. We do see some that are uh, almost 12 to 13 foot apart. So it's really massive animals. And um, from comparing year to year, you can get rates of erosion. So that's very helpful. Um, some of the ghost prints you can't see at the surface. So then we're using GPR and the GPR allows us to look into the subsurface and see uh, some of the, the different details we didn't see before. So for instance, in this area, I believe we are only able to see the, the mammoth trackway, but then with the GPR, you can see all these different um, human prints walking through here. There were some giant ground sloth also. And then whenever we brushed them out, then we were able to confirm, oh, that there, there definitely is, um, you know, these other track makers are walking right through the site too. So the GPR has been, been a really great tool. And Tommy Urban uh, with Cornell is really leading a lot of that work. And Matthew Bennett's leading a lot of the, the footprint work. He's our expert. And, and like you mentioned early, Jeff Pagotti and, and Kathleen Springer helping us with a lot of the dating, and um, the, the chronology. Um, the other thing we're, we're doing to try to get a handle on the rates of erosion and try to focus our energy where we should look first, um, we're, we're installing a series of weather stations. So this is a live network of weather stations, real time data. So you can, um, these weather stations, they collect the, the normal measurements. Most weather stations collect, you know, wind, um, precipitation, uh, temperature, but then also soil moisture and groundwater depth. So you can see um, right here, soil moisture right here. And then this is groundwater depth. So it was pretty dry and then it rained, so it bounced up. Um, well, it's interesting too, this is a little um, time-lapse camera. So there was, there is a trackway right here, but then it rained and whenever it rained, then you can no longer see. See the prints, it'll dry out again and then you'll be able to see them as long as they're not um, uncovered. So we're doing that and then correlating that with the, the satellite imagery, some of the soil moisture to get a sense of, of what's happening on the ground and predict where to look next and then uh, doing repeated surveys to see some of the erosion rates as well. The other thing we're really trying to do is use automated processes to do this. So a lot of the, um, AI type work. So have the computer learning to be able to look for the prints for us and look through the data um, to be able to standardize some of the, what we're doing with the thermal imagery, looking for the, the storm and rates of erosion, and then also comparing um, one year to the next for uh, on the ground erosion. So this is 2016 and in 2020, you can see um, some of the different erosion that's occurring. And then the same is true um, looking at the GPR data. So we're trying to teach you know, the computers to help us to identify um, prints in the GPR data and also get, you know, really increase the precision. So eventually, you know, we might not need to brush out every, every print. We might be able to get really incredible um, high measurements and, and with very high accuracy. So just different possibilities to try to preserve and, and get out to these areas as quickly as we can. Um, and then also using um, some of the AI also to find the images on the, the true color imagery. Uh, um, David, I yes. have a question, and that is, uh, is there any other matrix than uh, gypsum sand? Do you have any finer sediments like a LUS? You know, we, we do, but, it, but it, it's, it's, it's gypsum also. Um, <laughs> everything's gypsum of some kind or another. And, and some of those prints are, are really incredible. It's like a fluffy um, print. And, and you know what, what seems to happen is while well, we're working with um, some dust experts on this, but and I don't know if this is the case for every other place's desert systems, but at gypsum, the gypsum uh, has a high number of water molecules in it anyway, so it can freeze. The, the, the sand and the clay will freeze in the winter. And when it freezes, um, it expands and then, then it'll dry and it evaporates, it gets hot. So that, that'll make the, the soil um, really sort of airy and, and soft. 
And unfortunately, that's part of the, the rapid erosion. Once that happens, it sort of loses the structure. And there's other places, um, the, the whole playa system changes year round. And so you will get a really thick, um, fluffy uh, crust or sediment. It's almost like the consistency of flour. It looks like when you see, you know, you know Armstrong walking on the moon, that, that's sort of what, what I picture in my head is fluffy and it feels really bizarre to, to walk on. Um, and then up on the upland edges of the lake margin, we get like a, a loss or, you know, where we get this really um, soft, airy soil. And sometimes you see prints in there, those and they're, they're too soft to, to do anything or brush that just completely come apart. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you know, I mentioned earlier we don't we don't have the oldest prints, but but we do have some of the longest trackways. And the reason that that's so important is because they're so long that you get to see interactions that you don't always get to see in trackways. Lots of times, you know, you might have a few hundred prints if, if you're lucky. That's a really nice trackway. But some of the trackways we have at White Sands go for over two miles. It's it's. Um, you can often see, you know, a thousand prints in, in one trackway. And the reason that's important is because the longer prints you have and the, the more numbers you have, you see these incredible interactions. And you see um, people and animals overstepping each other over and over again. This is just one example of the, the double trackway. This goes for 1.5 kilometers, but you'll have, you know, it looks, we believe it, um, a mother carrying a child mid-sized foot, but they're carrying a child one direction and come back the other way. But along the journey, they'll step, you know, on top of the, the sloth print in one direction, and then, then the sloth steps on top of the human print, and then they come back the other way, um, and they pass by. So, you know, you see this, this happening over and over again. And then you see different behavior. You know, you see the kids jumping and having fun. The other thing, um, sometimes you'll see a person stretching to step over <laughs> a print or, you know, maybe a, a mammoth patty or something in the middle of the trail. You see people stretch, or sometimes you see them also stretch to step inside a mammoth print. You'll see over and over. Maybe it's muddy, and it's just easier to step inside a mammoth print, or uh, maybe it's a game for children. You see the same thing, where they'd have to stretch their stride to step inside a, a giant ground sloth um, footprint, and then you see the other animals step on top of those also. So it's it's really fun because these are so long. You get to see a lot of interactions. The other um, interesting thing. The mammoth, they don't seem to care too much about humans or you don't see changes in behavior of the trackways, but the animal that really um, changes quite a bit are the giant ground sloth. This happens repeatedly where you'll see a giant ground sloth walking along, you know, sort of just walking around, meandering sort of around the, the shore or the edge. And then if it crosses or comes by a human print, it's very common, they'll stand up and you'll see them go in a different direction or spin around and, and take off. They, they do funny little things and usually it's, uh, start moving in circles and sort of don't know what, which direction to go. So, you know, it seems like they were, they were very um, aware of humans. and They would, you know, change their, their behavior pattern uh, anytime they, they seem to sense humans. But if there's no human prints around, they'll just go keep going you know, for very long distances. They don't go in circles or just go in a straight wandering line. Um, this is an example. This is so the first from the first paper that was published, but basically you can see a person is walking by and they step inside the footprint of a, of a giant ground sloth. This was a really incredible story also. It looks like possibly um, a hunt happened. We don't see the body, so, you know, so we don't know for sure, but what you do see um, is a person running up to a giant ground sloth. The sloth stands up, spins around, and makes a bunch of marks in the ground. So it looks like you know, it's trying to well and you're swinging at the person, leaving marks in the ground. And then there's a person coming from behind the sloth, another person. The, the first person almost ran, and you can see them come up on the balls of their feet, almost chest to chest. It looks like ran right up to it and it stops right there. Um, but it's really incredible. And then, then they step backwards and the other person comes from the other direction. So it's sort of like little movie clips. You know, you don't see all of it, but you see a clip of the story here or there. So some of the interactions you get to see are just, just remarkable. Uh, this is, again, the, the giant ground cell sort of blown up. But 
um, you can see, so it looks like a mother, we believe, was carrying a child in one direction coming back. But um, right here, it looks like the person walked by and then the giant ground saw seemed to sense them and they turned around, but they step on top of the human print right here. And then they go by and then on the way back from the human prints, they step on top of the giant ground saw. So most likely, you know, maybe a few hours or a day or so that this, this happened. The other funny thing is one of my favorite prints of all the prints we see out there, about right here, I think it is, um, a person, they slip really, a really big slip in the mud. And the funniest thing is the giant ground sloth slips in the exact same spot and they catch themselves. They sort of like lean back on their tail and catch themselves. And this might be, this is one of the tail prints right here, but it looks like they, they slip back and sort of catch themselves. But it's funny, you know, you see um, the same ground sort of the animals and the megafauna, um, it, um, you know, responding to, to the ground or slipping at the exact same spot. This is a, another really fun uh, set where you see the, a uh, giant ground sloth probably walked by, maybe made this puddle right here bigger. And there's children prints all through here, all different sizes. And many of them are sort of two and two. There's all these are children prints too. But it looks like they were jumping, you know, splashing in the mud. So it's um, really neat to, to see that. And then uh, if you look closely, you can see the claw marks of the giant ground sloth. So the interesting thing at White Sense too, there's a lot of debate, you know, did the giant ground sloth walk on, on uh, two limbs or four limbs. And, you know, I don't know what the primary sort of mode that they'd walk was, but at White Sands, we definitely see that they walked on two legs. So this is on their hind feet. And then we do see them where they come back down and they go on four limbs also. It has a little bit different print. You'll see lots of times you'll have the back foot and then the, the front foot will come out with a big hook, will come out of the, the front foot and overstep the hind foot. But um, you can see, you know, in the same track sometimes of a, of a giant ground sloth, you'll see them walking on four limbs and then come up on two limbs and then go back down to four limbs or change their, their walking stance. So it's a lot of fun to see those interactions and what happens. Uh, here's one example of a, of a mammoth and then this human stepped inside it, but we have others where a uh, human track was walking by and then a the mammoth steps on top and sort of you know, you, you don't see the, the human print anymore. Just the very tip of it will pop out. A lot of cross cutting happening. Mm. And then this is uh, fun. Yes. Yeah, David. Uh, someone wanted to know: Do you find signs of uh, any material culture or modified material culture between the layers, like artifacts of some sort between? Uh, you know, I, I think one day we we will find. Artifacts, we do see artifacts on the surface. Um, they're, they're scrapers and hammer stones and those kind of things. So no, not points or more sort of diagnostic of recent times you might see. But there, there's increasing numbers, it, it looks like, of artifacts. So far, we don't see them under a sea layer with the prints. So we don't know for 100% you know, that they're contemporaneous, but we are seeing increased numbers. The other place that you see these artifacts sort of interesting is we have a lot of pools that form and I think that they've always been there. Maybe they recently got exposed again, but you'll see pools like this when it rains. And if you go out to those, you'll actually see camel prints or some of the other animals at the edge of these pools. Mm -hmm. And then you do see artifacts um, sometimes on the edge of these pools. So it looks like they both visited you know, but where that's one of the, the big questions and really what we're, we're waiting to see or looking for to see, you know, artifacts at the same layer of the, the trackways and then with a really nice seed horizon or charcoal or something that we can date them both at the same horizon. So far, we haven't seen that, but we are seeing increased numbers of, of lithics and stone tools on the ground um, at, on the top layer, the same surface layer of a lot of these exposed track, please. Thank you. Thank you. Here's a, an example of a um, human print and then there's some bison prints and then we do see sometimes these elongated sort of linear features too. There's a nice sort of cross cutting in there too. Um, then folks are asking about um, some of the dog prints so one example, sometimes our prints, they're sort of upside down and reverse of each other. So 
this is in positive relief instead of negative. So it looks like it, the animal or the person walks by, compresses the sediment. Sort of like when you walk through the mud or, or through the snow, you know, you walk by, you compress the snow, it warms up and all the rest of the snow melts, leaving behind just the, your trackway. And so that's sort of what we see um, sometimes in, in the mud. Um, some of these harder, we'll see have harder concretions or, or these mud prints. And then everywhere else, there's, it's funny because they might be a bright red and all the other sediments gone. You don't see that clay anymore, only in the prints. So that, that's really neat. This is a, we believe, a, a, maybe a dire wolf, but definitely a canine print that came through. Um, there's a nice trackway, about 30 of them. This disappeared in just a few years, the majority of them. I think that one or two years later, they're completely gone. Um, and then what's neat is embedded in the print are the seats that we're finding. That's how we're dating a lot of the other um, prints. And then the other fun things, we find places where it looks like possibly dung balls. These, um, this is broken in half, but these really incredible round balls. And it looks like, you know, I think it was a beetle running, rolling around dung, but they'll be uh, encapsulated um, plant material with the hard sort of gypsum sheet usually covering it. And this one, we actually found a hair. So we're, we do find hair, no bones, but we are finding uh, increased numbers of, of hairs. It's just one or two, but we within the prints and next to the prints, we are finding hair. So this hair was actually found about 25 feet away from um, this, this canine trackway. It's like right up to this side off screen. Um, this dumb ball washed out, the, the layer washed out and it rebuilt that. and then there was a hair inside and we first found it. Oh no, we, we contaminated the sample. We looked at the image before we collected it. No, it, it was in there. And then we sent it off to the National Animal Forensics Lab and it came back uh, most commonly looking like, most uh, likely it'd be a canine hair. They compared it with a lot of um, different um, species and sloth and other things like that. But um, it, it had the closest resemblance to, to canine. So a dog or wolf and then, Here's some examples, some of the uh, um, camel prints, and then we do see uh, teeth fragments. I believe this is a camel tooth fragment, and then it uh, looks like a lot of droppings or pellets of the camels in this area. So it's sort of funny. There's a lot of camel prints, and then you have all these little things that look like, like little pellets or droppings all around it. And then the other fun thing sometimes we get to see is what look like body prints. So, this is just an example of a zoo in China, a baby elephant. Mm -hmm. And then this is sort of finding out white sands. So you can see sort of the outline. Um, it's eroding away, but whenever we first found it, you can really see the feet coming down. It looks like a trunk right here, the, the eye socket, possibly even an ear right there impression. Um, so it looks like that as a baby, a uh, mammoth laying down, or maybe it was killed, I don't know, but, but in the middle of the, the trampled ground area. And then other places, sometimes we see what, you know, we're not certain, we don't see bones or, or protein right now, but sometimes you see what look like quarters, like a rib cage, maybe laying on the ground impression or, or a hind quarter or the forelimbs. So, um, you know, more work to be done, but we do, uh, we're seeing, uh, increasing patterns that, that look like maybe they're taking apart really large mammoths and separating them quarter. You know, so that's fun to see. This is one of the most recent uh, trackways that's found. It's a fun one. We're always finding more, but this one's really neat because you have giant ground sloth and you have mammoth coming through and then human. So it's fun when you see, get to see all the different track makers all together in the sort of same scene. But um, yeah, so just so wanted to, to thank you all for, for all um, the opportunity to speak to you. And um, maybe if it's okay, I was gonna play a video for you, but I'll be happy to answer any questions and I'll just leave this in the, in the background just for you to see. If anyone wants to see the trackways more, or see what those look like. Um, here's some video of it. So this is just some of the, the B-roll that was filmed um, right now. Uh, we're not allowed to, they changed the rules so we can't really take film groups and people like that back to these areas. So um, the park doc took some video of its own so they can document, but then also to share with people that are interested in doing documentaries. So that's available.
anyone would like to see. Um, I don't know, it's probably about an hour or more now and a lot of video and images and things that um, people can take the time if they're interested and look at some of the different, um, different ones we have. You'll see that these are some of the human prints, but then there's mammoth. There's also the most recent, I think of, um, uh, it should be here also. The most recent also of the trends you can find here also. Oh, if you scroll down, there it is. There we go. So that's the trench. And I'll show you one other uh, print, one of my favorite uh, prints we just recently found. Let's see if I can pull it up for you. But it's uh, looks like a bear print. So those are a lot of fun. There's a baby bear and then a large bear as well. and giant ground slot head mixed into, let's see. So this is the- David, yes. has anybody done, uh, a podiatrist done studies of the human footprints at all to determine if the people are flat-footed or they have what the length of the feet are or size? Yeah. Um, Matthew Bennett's done a lot of that. So he does a lot of forensics type of science, for, I think with um, some of the police departments over there uh, in, in England. And, and so he specializes in, in a lot of sort of uh, foot measurements as it relates to um, for, for forensics. But uh, he, he does a lot of really uh, great measurements and if you look up the, the papers, you'll see some of the comparisons and, and the very fine measurements that, that he uses to, to look at a lot of those. And I know they're using computers to sort of identify um, very fine details. And I think he was saying that the computer, they don't know how, but it's even able to, it looks like it has a really high probability of being able to tell you know, uh, men from, from women prints apart from each other. So they don't know what, what it's picking up on, but it's sort of neat that it's really fine um, measurements and details it's able to, to pull out. Yeah. Evidently this bear is bigger than a polar bear. I think so. You know, I've, I've never seen a polar bear just looking online. Some of them, but these, they're, they're just tremendous. They're just really large. So these are, are centimeters, but really large. And there's a, actually a human footprint mixed inside there. And then, Here's a uh, sloth print. And then uh, there's some baby bear prints inside there as well. Huh. Uh, this, this was just a, a lot of fun to, <laughs> to see this trackway. So you can see there's two prints here and then there. So you have the, this, the sort of hind foot um, right in front of the, the forefoot so over and over again. It's, it's, yeah, it's a neat, neat print to to see one of the most recent. This and it was actually found at the top of of the trench um, is where those prints were, were recently found. Amazing. So, questions for David? One other, perhaps. Oh, here, somebody's yeah. asking: uh, uh, Is it Columbia or or, or woolly mammoth? Yeah, they, they believe it's Columbia Mammoth. I think um, Spencer Lucas and Gary Morgan they have a paper, I think, looking at the different stride and gait and things, and maybe the known animals from the region, but they believe it was probably Columbia Mammoth in this area. Um, if, I, if I understood your, your map right, uh, this all of these tracks are in the northwestern part of the park? That's right, basically across the whole western side of the park. Okay, because I, I mean, many memories of, of playing in the dunes on, uh, you know, on the, the, the south, southeastern side. So, I mean, yes. are, these well, are these well out of the way of... of... Yeah, the public, <laughs> yeah, visiting right, right now, um, they, they are, unfortunately. So we have what's called the co-use line it comes about right right here unfortunately yeah. so um what that is 
is we're basically surrounded by White Sands Missile Range. It's been a proving ground and testing ground. So they do a great job of cleaning up everything nowadays. But I think like the 70s and beyond, there's a lot of bomblets and UXO and unexploded ordnance and um, all kinds of, of, of things. So it's, it's dangerous for people to go back to these areas, unfortunately. So this area is closed off to the public. Okay. We are working to, to make some new exhibits up, up front. And it's a, we'll put it at a playa, so it's very similar to the back area. But then there will be casts where people can touch and, and get a sense of what those look like. And I'm hoping we can put some silhouettes, life-size silhouettes of the animals. People can stand on the side as well. No, that'll be uh, cool. David, one thing you might look for is uh, yama, uh, that is a llama. Uh -huh. They've been found uh, as far north as uh, Valsequillo in uh, a site in north of Mexico City. So um, it's possible that they may have gone farther north. Uh, it would be interesting if they're represented in your pit, in your prints. No. Yeah, I'm really curious because we, we see, I think we, I believe we definitely have camelopsis, so the big guy, uh, the camelids, but we do see smaller, it looks like camel, camelids. I've often wondered if it, if it wasn't the, the llama ones because they're, you know, they you can confuse them with the horse sometimes. They're a little bit bigger, but maybe three inches or so where the, the, the camel ops is, is pretty, pretty hefty uh, mm -hmm. print. But I've often wondered, yeah, I'd love to know if they were for the other ones. We we have uh, Mike Doherty here and we have a site up in Squim. It's called the Manus Mastodon site. And uh, just curious, can can you distinguish a mastodon from a, your mammal? Or I don't know if a, a mastodon would be in that kind of a environment either. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I know Spencer Lucas and Gary Morgan really did the, the work on, on the trackways, but um, I, I won't be surprised if you don't see mam mastodon and mammoth, especially on that eastern edge. Um, I know in the missile range, not far at all, there definitely is um, mastodon. I found a, a really nice um, skeleton just, just recently. Of the, the, I think it's probably right here somewhere is, is the mastodon that was, was recently found. So I, I think it is very uh, possible. And then in, in the park, there's an old ranching report, but I believe they talk about just being a stream area right past Lake Lucero, and they, they mention a, a spring or a wetland that stayed full of water year round. There's a deep little pool here. I guess the kids are playing and they bumped up against the edge and um, it opened up in a, a mammoth skeleton. Um, remains were exposed and I don't know, I know, oh, it might have been Yale, or they, they invited a university to help re, um, remove them and it sounds like the only thing they were able, really able to remove it that was saved, everything else was crumbled, but, but they did have a big molar of a, of a mammoth. So it looks like they did have mammoth, at least in this area, and then mastodon, not too far, sort of on these, going up to the uplands areas of starting to head up the mountain. Okay, raise your hand if you want, but other questions for David? Hey, Dale, this is Scott. I, I've got one yeah, for Scott. David. Um, I, I wasn't real clear. Have the pollen, have the dates on the pollen come back yet? I know the dates were on um, some of the aquatic plants, and I'd heard you guys had collected enough pollen for dating. Are, are those mm -hmm. dates in yet? No, they're, they're not. It's a work in, in progress. It'll be exciting to, to see what, what those come back at. I believe they'll be looking at the different um, species from from the pollen as well. So that'll be really neat to see if it's some of the old growth trees or what, what they find also. Cool. Uh, that's currently in the works. I have another question. Um, is yeah. the nature of the material such that it preserves or organic materials within the strata? I, I know there's seeds in there, but are you seeing other things like sticks and twigs there? Something no. that might suggest that cordage could be preserved? Not, not yet. Um, that, that's really interesting. So far, I don't know why. I don't know if it's just the rupia is just more, you know, a hardy 
outer shell or what, why it's preserved, but only the rupia so far, the, the seeds and looks like spikelets or some of the other um, plant parts, but it looks like only that the rupia see the ditch grass for some reason. Um, one interesting thing, I don't know if it's on here, but we did find one print, we'll see. Possibly it'll be a, a moccasin, but it almost looks like there might be a weaving at the bottom you know, or a sandal or something like that, but possibly a, a weaving, but but no no organic material, just impressions possibly. So we'll see if, if that turns out to be true. Other, other questions? Yes, apart from uh, puddle jumping and wildlife viewing, is there any evidence of what people were doing out on the lake bed? No, no. I mean, we, we have a few places where the sloth were definitely reacted to to the humans. I, I would say there's a few other spots um, sort of interesting. Normally, you only see mammoth um, walking sort of you know parallel to to the, the lake, just along this lake edge. Um, but occasionally you will see a mammoth walk straight into the lake. And I've seen, I think at three places now, and um, at two of the three of those, a person <laughs> was walking behind the mammoth. You'll see one person or, or a, a large group walking behind. So, you know, I don't know if it was, if they were hunting them or pushing them into the lake or what, what was happening there, trying to get them stuck in the mud or, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, not so far. Just seen seen folks um, going across, and not sure exactly what what else they may have been doing yet. But we do see, you know, we have to confirm the the artifacts. But there are some lithics further further out, and sort of in these it looks like probably wetland areas. And then above, you see like this little nodge or little hump. There, there will be sometimes artifacts up on top of those. It's only a rise, maybe a, a foot or two, but those areas today, they'll still flood and then there'll be small rises. And that's sometimes we see concentrations of some mm -hmm. of the, the lithic material. David, we have a question from Duncan about, and I'm curious too, about uh, any DNA analyses, especially let's say the hair in the scat or, and then they're getting into what, is basically called dirt DNA, where they're actually yeah. eating things uh, in the dirt where the people mm -hmm. lived, but maybe they, you know, were really living there long enough to to uh, contribute their DNA. I don't know if a footstep would have yeah. dirt DNA. Yeah, I, I don't know. We we tried one spot where there was a, a big group of people. I think following the, the mammoth. Um, but that was only one, I think only one time we've attempted so far and we weren't able to find DNA at that time. But um, I'm really excited um, inside the, the top of that, that bear print. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I think it was, oh, let's see. This one, yeah. right. I think it's, I think it was in this one. It's a deeper print. There was one hair. Uh, oh. by itself and it's a very very coarse hair sort of a blonde looking hair but very coarse I don't I, I'm not familiar with what their hair should look like but I'll be excited to, to see um, but it looked like there's a follicle on it so I'm not sure how much material is needed to do DNA but but it appears that they may be a follicle still attached to it so that's what's so funny too because everything you know things some things that rode so fast the gypsum's hard but i don't know and then hairs and seeds for some reason they, they seem to preserve and i don't know why i'd be really curious i see uh a question from our geologist pat pringo is is there any evidence of volcanic ash lamination uh not that the I'm aware of it in these areas. We definitely get, you know, really dark oxidized layers, but of a, of a true ash, I don't, can't think. Mostly we have the oxidized sort of horizon. In some places we have tufa, so some of the, the spring sort of relationship type material, but I'm not aware of an, of an ash so far. Uh -huh. uh, other questions, David, did you want? Uh, David Rice, did you have one? 
Uh, thank you. I've uh, already asked several. Yeah. Um, any is there any evidence either near the lake or in the foothills of of settlements? Uh, I mean, are these just not? You know, we don't. They, 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 they had to be going or coming from someplace. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there's large settlements all around these regions. You know, um, a lot of those though, they're, they're archaic or sort of Puebloan time frame. And then along the upper regions or upper lake margins, we do see a lot of archaic and, and maybe late paleo time frame uh, size, usually, you know, artifacts here or there, some some of the Lancelot points up higher, and possibly a bison kill site, but it looks like that's more, most likely more recent related to the sort of younger driest time frame, and then the the tracks we seem to be on the next lower horizon so um so far we don't we don't know i don't know of anything in this area that high up but um you know it is possible i know there's some caves nearby I think, um, near mockingbird gap and some of those areas where i've read in the past descriptions of of possibly uh, uh um, I think bones that with with man, some of the mammoths and maybe marks on it and stuff. But um, I don't know that there was a, an early uh, report. So I'd be curious someday. Maybe we will see some dates and some something in some of the caves. But I don't know of any right now. I I think you know you never with this kind of work you're doing. Uh, there's always going to be surprises. There's mm -hmm. always something new coming up. Yeah. And uh, that must be a good uh, part of the work. And it's like wet sites. You never know what kind of a wood or fiber artifact you might find. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think might find a fire pit, you know, with people around it or something if if they stopped on the lakeside and yeah. are cooking something or something like that. I think we will one day, you know, there, there's definitely, um, if you know White Sands, you you know that there's um, thousands of, of they call them hearth mounds, but basically uh, when you burn anything on gypsum, it turns to hydride, hemohydride, it basically loses a water molecule like plaster paris. Mm -hmm. um, so we have these preserved fire hearths everywhere. Um, but at this lower lake level, the, the, the gypsums, we don't have the gypsum sand, but I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's just a matter of time. I think, you know, people, I think if they're walking through, they're not as likely to drop um, the, some of the stone tools. And I think a lot of where we find the prints is in the, the wet sort of area of marsh. So a lot, unfortunately right now, a lot of the upper upland area is covered with dunes or it got really badly eroded and just been desiccated, broken out of there. But I, I, I think it's just a matter of time in the uplands and maybe on the west side, we will find some older campsites because they, they have to be some somewhere around it. Yeah, it's kind of like trackways in England, the uh, wooden walkways, you know, it's just luck of the straws if somebody happens to lose or drop mm -hmm. it. They're just going through the area with hundreds mm -hmm. of tracks. Um, we probably have time for two more questions for David. You have some others? Anyone? Well, I sure, nobody? Okay, I sure. have a part, have more, Wait more a second, Mick. More personal, when, when were you at state? Uh, let's see, um, uh, 95, uh, to about, um, uh, 2002. Okay. You're way after me. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So it was, you know, I had a, I had a class with Stedman up and way back when in the 80s. Yeah. I, I know, I know his name. Yeah, uh, pr pretty big in Southwest archaeology at, at yes. the top. At mm -hmm. the top. Uh, so, uh, okay, it was well. Thank you, thank you. This is actually really interesting. I'm kind of missing the old stomping ground. <laughs> yes, so, yeah, an amazing place and great place to get green chili and red chili. Also, if you're in the area. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs>
grew up in Alamo and Cruces. So. Yes. One more question. <laughs> Vic probably has one. Vic? Maybe not. But uh, we, we sure appreciate you showing us this uh, amazing uh, new development in, in the prehistory of the, uh, of the uh, Americas. And it, it it's, uh, will be very interesting to follow, but thanks for joining our program up here in the Northwest. And uh, I don't think it's too late for you. It must be nine o'clock or something. Yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah, no, thank, yeah. thank you so much. And we'll have a, hopefully we'll have a really incredible trail um, up soon, some wayside exhibits, but then some of the, the cast people can come by and, and take a look for themselves as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, th thanks so much. We appreciate thank, thank you all. Sure, thank you. sure appreciate your help with this, David, and your involvement with us. Thank you all. Have a, have a good yeah, evening. Have a good, yeah, uh, good field work. I know you're really doing a lot right now. Yeah, I got a nice sunburn from today, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a good, good week. <laughs> yeah, you look a little redder than the yeah. last, uh, last week. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, nice talking to you. Have a, have a good night. Well. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.